Lots to talk about out of the groove today. Some big sweeping changes coming to Front Row Motorsports. And then we got to talk about some controversies from this past weekend at New Hampshire. How's it going y'all? My name is Eric and welcome to Out of the Groove. I got that sign back there so you know even though I'm in my car again y'all know you're in the right place. I'm not homeless I swear. I'm just visiting friends and their place has terrible lighting so I figured I'd just you know, do this out here in the hot hot sun. But anyway we've got some NASCAR news to discuss today. We've got some just conversations that I think need to be had. Uh, New Hampshire. It was a pretty good race. Talked about that a couple days ago if you missed that episode or if you missed the New Hampshire race. Hear everything I had to say about it a couple days ago. Uh, but there were some controversies this weekend that I didn't really discuss in depth in that video. Uh, some of them weren't even Cup Series related, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. But first, a couple quick kind of news and notes going around. Firstly, and this is sad news, uh, Nick Harrison, crew chief for Colleague Racing, uh, suddenly passed away this past weekend at age 37. Cause of death has not been disclosed, but uh, it's safe to say that the garage area lost a top competitor and a great friend to many. My thoughts are with his family, that whole team, because that is just a very tragic situation to go through. He worked with many great drivers during his career, and I'm sure he will be deeply missed. Now, talk Talking about some breaking news this week, earlier this morning, Front Row Motorsports made a kind of sudden announcement. Here's the report. Personnel changes to the number 36 of Matt Tift and the number 38 of David Reagan will take place this weekend at Pocono Raceway and remain in effect for the duration of the 2019 season. And you can see the official post. Effective today, Front Row Motorsports has selected to switch the crew chiefs and crews for the number 36 and number 38 teams, uh, respectively. Seth Barber will be the crew chief of the 36 team and Mike Kelly, who is in his first year with Front Row Motorsports this year, uh, uh, we'll now move over to the 38. And yes, this will be in effect for the remainder of the 2019 season. Kind of out of nowhere, we don't talk about Front Row uh, Motorsports very often because they're a smaller team working with limited resources, so credit where credit is due. They're trying to do a lot with a little, but I feel like they have to be kind of disappointed with the results they've seen this year. Uh, with this new aero package at Intermediate Tracks, it was supposed to, I think, kind of equalize the field a little bit more, give some of the you know slower teams kind of a chance to catch up. We've seen this year, like with Ryan Newman, turning that number six car into a playoff contender. We've seen Chris Buescher consistently run top 15 especially at a lot of uh, intermediate tracks and JTG Doherty equipment so we've seen how kind of you know three star four star teams have looked and been able to run with the big names but front row motorsports that has not happened this year uh, if we look at the point standings right now the driver standings for their three cars 27th 30th and 31st and you see the two guys there in the 30s are the ones that are having their crews and crew chiefs uh, swapped out looking at this again there are only 31 drivers running full-time this year and 30th and 31st in the points are front row motorsports drivers now Matt Tift is a rookie. I didn't expect a whole lot from him this year, but David Reagan, he's won races in the Cup Series before. He's got two wins. I know both were super speedway tracks, but still, he's won in the Cup Series before in Front Row Motorsports equipment, so I'm a little surprised to see David Reagan struggling this uh, this badly this year, but that's probably what led to this sudden change. I don't know. I guess I just expected a little bit more from Front Row Motorsports, especially with the package change this year and with them adding a third car. You know, that 36 car, it's not a new car, but it, they didn't have it last year. It's new this year, I guess. I think they got to be a little disappointed with their performance this year and that's probably why they're making this kind of sudden drastic change. Now let's talk specifically about New Hampshire this past weekend. Brief news here reported by Adam Stern from Sports Business Journal. Uh, TV ratings up slightly this year for New Hampshire compared to this race a year ago. 1.7 versus a 1.6 so he marks that as a 6% increase. Pretty sweet deal in the overnight TV ratings. NASCAR ratings continue to be slightly up this year from last year. Uh, I didn't talk about it because I was on in a, in a rush but uh, the week before Kentucky TV ratings actually dipped slightly about 6% so between Kentucky and New Hampshire, Kentucky last week being slightly down, New Hampshire this week being slightly up. Uh, pretty even, and it's been pretty even the last two weeks on, on the TV ratings front. Now let's talk more about New Hampshire. There was a few questions during that race about penalties, about drivers that weren't penalized specifically uh, for certain actions during the Cup Series race. One that was very notable was Eric Jones uh, in stage three on that final caution. He kind of was looking like he was going to go to pit road and then at the last second decided to duck out. But as he ducked off of pit road, his uh, left side tires did clip the orange commitment box. In years past when there used to be a cone sitting there hitting the cone uh, effectively was a penalty however now and you can see in NASCAR's rule book this year uh, the only way it's a penalty is if all four tires hit or are below the orange uh, square in Eric Jones case since only two of his tires hit the square that is not a penalty now I understand why a lot of fans are confused by this because this is a penalty this is a rule that has changed quite a bit as with many NASCAR rules over the years so I can understand a lot of fans being confused like whoa he hit the box I thought that was an obvious penalty uh, but no this year and it's clearly stayed there in the rules uh, it's only a penalty if all four tires are below the, the line and then you turn off pit road, that's when it becomes a penalty.
penalty. So Eric Jones himself was even confused in the race. He thought he might've gotten a penalty, uh, but no, the rule book clearly states this isn't Joe Gibbs favoritism. This isn't NASCAR playing favorites or anything. No, it's clearly been stated in the rule book all year long. You can read it for yourself. Another non-call in this race that had some people questioning uh, was Eric Almarola's restart. He was in charge of restart in stage two and seemingly brake checked the field prior to the restart zone or once in the restart zone and used that to his advantage and was able to kind of screw up the restart and take off without any competition. Show you a little clip of the replay here. Now, a couple weeks ago, uh, William Byron got a penalty for jumping the restart. You know, in that case, the leader, I don't remember who the leader was in that race, but NBC did a really good job of showing the telemetry where the leader in that race never changed speed. He just went from 65 or whatever to going. And William Byron in second place kind of tried to jump the start. That's why Byron got a penalty. Eric Almarola was not issued a penalty for this, even though, and I don't have the exact clip here, but NBC showed during the broadcast on his telemetry that he definitely brake checked the field. He was going about 65 and then all of a sudden it dropped to like 40 for a second before he hit the gas. Clearly looking at the telemetry, Almarola was playing games on the restart. He got a warning from NASCAR for doing that, uh, but they did not penalize him. Given that they penalized William Byron uh, a couple weeks ago, I was surprised they did not give Almarola the same penalty. Mainly because Almarola's was clearly more egregious. I mean, he took off and was like a half a straightaway ahead of the pack by the time they got to turn one. Like, that's pretty egregious. I'm shocked there wasn't a penalty. That one I don't really have an excuse for. I'm just surprised they didn't penalize him. You know, NASCAR does often give warnings when it comes to playing games on a restart like this, but that seemed pretty deliberate, seemed pretty uh, dramatic. It was pretty obvious. So I'm a little surprised Almarola did not get a penalty for that, but. I don't know, at least, you know, hopefully NASCAR can be a little more consistent with that. I know in the K&N race at Sonoma a few weeks ago, you know, Ryan Priest got penalized on restart, Noah Gregson got penalized on restart, and neither of those penalties seemed very legit in my opinion. Uh, and then the William Byron one, I think they got the rule right in the William Byron penalty a couple weeks ago, but, you know, I don't know, this Almirola one was probably the most egregious, and to see that one go unpenalized, I was... I'm a little surprised by, but you guys be the judge. I think it is a judgment call for NASCAR and they went, they chose in favor of Eric Almarola here. I do like that they try to keep things, you know, with the drivers. They try to keep it in the driver's hands. I don't like that they're not immediately trying to take away from the drivers, but I don't know. I thought this one deserved a penalty. Now, another controversy from New Hampshire, but not Cup Series related. I didn't discuss it in my post-race episode Sunday night because I was mainly talking about Cup Series stuff, but we have to talk about that Xfinity race. It was just another New Hampshire race won by Christopher Bell. He's dominated this track since he's been in the Xfinity Series. Uh, so not a whole lot to report on there, but there was some drama between one of the veterans of the sport and one of the youngest, newest competitors. Late in the race, when battling in the top five, uh, Paul Menard, who was the only Cup Series driver uh, racing in this race, decided to intentionally wreck Harrison Burton, 18 year old making, I think just his third uh, Xfinity start of his career, maybe fourth. Paul Menard said on the radio immediately afterwards that he did it on purpose. He owned up to it. Credit for, to Paul Menard there for owning up to the fact that he spun a guy out on purpose. But of course the controversy is, did Harrison Burton deserve to get spun out like that? And the question that I think some fans were raising is when a Cup Series regular comes down to the Xfinity Series and is racing with younger drivers who in some cases are in a points battle, should they race those guys with you know a different type of respect? Should they race differently? I'm not a big fan of changing the way you race based on who you're racing around, but I do think in this case, Paul Menard crossed a line. Paul Menard was upset with Harrison Burton for this little bit of contact that happened briefly uh, a couple laps beforehand. Burton slid up slightly when trying to make the pass, rubbed him ever so slightly, but got off him pretty quick. Uh, Paul Menard took exception to that contact, and that's apparently what led to him dumping the 18. Now, I gave Paul Menard some credit for owning up to his decision, but I'll also give Harrison Burton some pretty good credit here. Immediately after the race, even though he's only 18 years old and Paul Menard's been around a while, uh, Harrison Burton went right up to uh, Paul Menard and confronted him on pit road and had a very, uh, you know, strong Strongly worded discussion about the incident. There's just some snippets of it. Still not sure what all I can show you guys without NASCAR and NBC and people getting mad at me. I try to be extremely neutral when I look at these situations. And I try to objectively view each driver's viewpoint, and that's what I'm gonna do in this case. But you know, after looking at the evidence, I side with Harrison Burton. I think Paul Menard crossed the line. A little bit of contact here and there in a race that saw plenty of door slamming contact throughout the field. I think Paul Menard 
kind of crossed the line. I think he overreacted to that little bit of contact. As Harrison Burton pointed out in that video, there wasn't a scratch on the 12 car of Menard, uh, and you know, Paul Menard still managed to come home and finish in the top five in that race. My biggest problem with this incident, and I took to Twitter, and I talked about it a little bit on there right after it happened, is I don't like that a you know mediocre Cup Series driver, because uh, that's what Paul Menard is, he's a mediocre Cup Series driver. I don't like that a mediocre Cup Series driver came down to the Xfinity Series and just took out a kid who's still trying to make a career for himself. Harrison Burton's only 18. Like I said, he's only made a few Xfinity Series starts this year. He's still new to the series, new to the sport in a lot of ways. I know a lot of people say he's underperformed in the truck series this year, and he has slightly, uh, but he's still got plenty of years ahead of him. He's still only 18 years old. There's plenty of room to learn, pl plenty of room to grow, and so it's too early to say whether Harrison Burton's got a real Cup Series future or if he doesn't. It's too early to say that. That's why I say he's still trying to make a career for himself, and he was having a great day in New Hampshire. You know, only made a couple Xfinity starts this year. That's a tough track. He was running top five late in the race. He was having a great day. Uh, and to have be, get, be taken out like that by a veteran driver who's been here before, you know, I thought that was just not fun. That's not cool. I just don't really think it looks that good for Paul Menard. Similar last year when Kevin Harvick got angry with Ross Chastain in an Xfinity race. In that case, Chastain did rough Harvick up a little bit, but uh, you know, Harvick's comments afterwards about how Ross Chain, Chastain was never going get to get a good opportunity because of the way he races, you know, those were all uncalled for. At least in that case, Kevin Harvick is an established NASCAR veteran, an established champion, a future Hall of Famer. Paul Menard. <sighs> not saying Paul Menard's a bad driver, but he's certainly not, you know, earned the ability to kind of be the enforcer of what is good racing in the Xfinity and lower series. Like, uh, he hasn't earned that. But that's just my opinion. It raises a question, though. Should Cup Series guys race differently when they go down into the lower series? I mean, that, should they be held to a different standard? Should they race guys with more respect? Because, you know, they may be in the championship battle versus you're not actually invested in the series. Like, I don't know. That raises an interesting question. I'd be curious to know what you guys think. I think in this specific incident, yes, Paul Menard crossed the line. I don't think the little bit of contact he got from Burton warranted him wrecking Burton entirely. Uh, but that being said, I don't know what you guys think. What do you, whose side are you on in this whole issue, this whole deal? And what do you think about Cup guys in the Xfinity Series? I know a lot of people don't like the Cup Series guys coming down and dominating in the Xfinity Series, but when it actually comes to how they race each other, what are you guys' opinions on that? I'd be curious to know. But that's all I have for this episode. Thank you all so much for watching, as always. Remember to follow me on Twitter so you don't miss my hot takes immediately after things happen. Uh, follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes stuff and just life stuff. And then of course a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. Michael Harrison at you as the stars. Mentally defective Cameron James, John Coblenz, Jason R. Long, Wesley Donaldson, Isaac Dennison, Mika Suzuki, iFancyRace.com, TheRacingInsiders.com, Matthew Koulopoulos, Pepe Luscious, Jeremy Conkling, Emilio Garcia, Joey DiMicino, and the rest of these incredible Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this without you all. Uh, so thank you for the continued support of me, of the show. Uh, we got some, hopefully some pretty big things in the work. I will be at Bristol in a about a, less than a month. It's we're less than a month away from the Bristol night race, so I feel like I should start hyping that up. I'm going to be doing a meetup with a uh, meet and greet with some of the other uh, NASCAR Weekly podcasts and other NASCAR YouTubers. Uh, we'll have more details on that soon, but I will be at the Bristol night race, so if you see me, come say hi. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks for watching, everyone. Got a lot more episodes planned in the coming weeks. Uh, a lot of lynch crazy things happening behind the scenes, but I think you guys are also going to get some great videos in the near future. So thanks for watching. See you guys again very, very soon. Have a good rest of your, uh, have a good rest of your Wednesday or Tuesday. Wait, what day is today? I don't actually know. Whenever this episode comes out, geez.